What's good, y'all? It's the Doom Shack. It's React, and we're back with another video. Who we got today, see? Today we're back with another American reaction. So excited about this video. If you're new to us, and we're new, new to you, make sure you scroll down, hit, hit that, that subscribe, subscribe button, button, and turn on the post notification bell. Because we're, we're on the road to 200K. And we cannot get there without you guys, all right? Join the family without further ado. Let's get into the video. Let's get it. See, I feel like when I said it was cute, how you stumbled the last video, you're starting to do it on purpose because you like to hear me say it's cute. I'm not starting to stumble on purpose. I'm not. Uh -huh. I'm not. Fluffy look. Just two okay. channels. I promise you this is not a gimmick. What you probably know is Ebonics and what linguists call African American English or African American language or sometimes Black English, the Black ones anyway, is way more grammatically complex and subtle and nuanced and, yes, sophisticated than people think. Uh-oh. But that's not the reputation it has. So first, why the reputation? And then I'll tell you all about the more complex grammar, which is really cool. Before I continue, I just want to add that I'm working on a book right now about how Black English has shaped all of American English, mm -hmm. but its impact is in many ways invisible or even actively erased. If you're interested in that book, and you should be, please leave me a comment saying so. Maybe even ask me what you wish you knew about it. That way, publishers and agents can see how much interest there actually is, and I'm more likely to get it to market. First things first, teeny tiny history lesson. America has a complicated history with race. That's an understatement. Anybody watching this probably knows that what is now the U.S. had hundreds of years of chattel slavery in which Africans and later their descendants were enslaved in the American South. And yes, other groups were enslaved and have been throughout history, but in the U.S., the Irish ran away and then claimed they weren't Irish and nobody could tell. And the indigenous people ran away and then got really good at staying away because they already knew the terrain better. They were here first. Slavers very quickly settled on bringing Africans who, if they even survived the trip, were in a foreign land, stood out wherever they went, and were thrown in with people who didn't speak the same languages. And that's kind of an important part here. You have lots of people who are native speakers of Bantu languages, but who are forced to communicate using either the plantation creole or some form of English. Now's not the time to go into all the detail about the linguistic arguments about the genesis of African American English, and in it fact, we can never really know because we have insufficient and wildly unreliable records. It's a huge... Okay, I just want to make this mention, being yeah, that we have a wrist. channel where people tune in from all over and we discuss cultures a lot. I just want to correct just one thing that he said. I'm not going to be nitpicking, but just one thing that he said about slavery in the South. It wasn't just in the South, it was everywhere. Y'all know I'm a history buff, so just got to make that mention. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. was the whole United States. No, I think that was a bar. I think that's yeah, a good mention. Yeah. yeah. Now's not the time to go into all the detail about the linguistic arguments about the genesis of African American English, and in fact, we can never really know because we have insufficient and wildly unreliable records. It's a hugely contentious issue in linguistics. And that unreliability of records is kind of the point. The U.S. has a mainstream culture that stereotypes black people as lazy and unintelligent. Mm. And it comes in large part out of our history of slavery and Jim Crow. Unintelligent is a justification for forcing people to do manual labor they don't want to do. And lazy is one way of looking at their resisting literal slavery. You go pick tobacco in Maryland in June and get back to me about how enthusiastic you are about doing that all day, what what? every day. Until after the Civil War, black <laughs> Americans were denied even basic education, albeit with some exceptions. And it wasn't until the middle of the 20th century that they were guaranteed equal and not separate access to education, at least on paper. But also, we tend to overstate the importance of formal education and academic norms around the right way to speak. Bro, Any which is crazy because education was, in, was free at one point. Mm -hmm until Help black people too. started to <laughs> get involved with the curriculums in the school and they had to get education so they can get certain jobs and blah 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 you know um that's crazy that is really yes. crazy but let's mm. be thankful for our hbcus yeah and let us also give thanks to the people who helped us to create the hbcus as well yeah yeah, yeah. yep i feel like when we get into our history it's like you can't mention one without the other and then that without the other and then well, that without the other you know what i'm saying well, you got to look at it like this. Sometimes when we are watching these videos, especially when it's videos about us, mm -hmm. it's people's first time hearing this information. Always. So. 100%. Yeah. Language you could name, including the Sometimes. fancy educated ones like Latin, were developed by illiterate people. Literally, since language change is driven by kids. So over the last 400 years, black Americans have developed a distinct language variety. Not all black Americans, obviously. And in fact, more than one variety. 
Gullah and Black English are not the same. Ebonics actually historically referred to all the different language varieties that came out of the New World contact between West African languages and European colonial languages. So technically, Brazilian Portuguese, Haitian Creole, and Gullah are all Ebonics too. But the point is that it is its own distinct language variety. Maybe a dialect of English, maybe a decreolized Creole. As I've said in other videos, it has rules. This means that it's not just breaking the rules of classroom English. It's a language variety with highly regular, highly systematic rules. The rules are just different from classroom English. And that's where we get to my claim that it's more complicated and sophisticated. I'm not saying the dudes on the corner outside in Harlem where I live hanging out and smoking are necessarily more sophisticated by our cultural standards than the Ivy League professors teaching down the street at Columbia in their tweet or whatever. But I am absolutely saying that their language use is grammatically more sophisticated than the English being taught to those Ivy League legacy students in their first year writing classes. So hear me out. A lot of you like my channel for language learning and linguistics content about other languages. Many know that I'm big on thinking about how languages treat tense, aspect, and mood. Hmm. If you haven't watched my videos about these, all you really need to know is that we abuse the word tense in English to refer to all three. To grossly oversimplify, tense actually refers to whether some shape of the verb indicates when something happens. Aspect indicates whether it's thought of as ongoing or completed, and mood refers to something that indicates in some way how the speaker feels about what they're talking about. Some languages have only tense or only aspect, so for instance, Mandarin Chinese has aspect but not tense. Biblical Hebrew had aspect and not tense. Modern Hebrew has tense and aspect is a bit iffy. In English, we have modal verbs like you should do this or you must do that, but other languages can modify, modify basically anything, so you have things like the subjunctive that indicates doubt about the proposition. It also does other stuff that's more structural because languages are messy. So the point here is when I say black English is more complicated and sophisticated, what I mean is that the grammatical system of tense, aspect, and mood in black English makes more and more nuanced distinctions. Where it gets confusing is that it does so with basically the same words just used differently. Dr. Arthur Spears calls... Yes, like, for instance, you good? Yeah, I'm good. You good? Mm-hmm. You good? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. That's three I knew. Things. I already knew. I already knew what she meant, by mm -hmm. the way, y'all. Because if you ever get someone that's just approaching you and be like, are you good? You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Then you can be at ease with it. But if you're chilling, somebody hits you with that, you good? Like, you like you straight? Mm-hmm. And people around would know based off of what he said tense aspect and mood what type of mood is about to be yeah so either they would tense up mm. right or they would just all keep relaxed and calm because they mm -hmm. understand what you good means mm -hmm. and how it's being delivered you mm -hmm. know and it's interesting, like interesting. because i always say this about you know us living in a country but having a whole different experience in the same country right our household it's an African-American household. We do things that is our culture, and especially from regional culture. Y'all know we have our broad culture. Then we have regional culture and state and city. Right. So we have, in this house, if somebody came, one of our friends who are from Texas and they came into our house, mm. they already know we're doing a lot of different things than what they're used to out in the state of Texas where we live. Right. Because we're just so culturally... This is us. This is our space. So our children would know how to speak the different things that we have taught them because we're they're learning English for the first time from us. Right. Even our two year old, she knows our dialect. She knows our mood. If we say different things in, you know, like when I just asked you about you good, you good, you good, she'll understand what we're what we're saying. <laughs> As a two year old, I just, I, I just had a moment because let's say if she's like just just. Speaking out, right? If she's jumping up and down and you'd be like, you good? She would know to sit down. Mm. But if she's, you know, quiet and she's alone, you say you good, she would be like, I need this or something. Yeah. Vice versa. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, just thought that, I just thought, I'm okay. I thought yeah, that was funny. Yeah. Yeah, that's and so that was one of the problems that I had all throughout school. When I got to school, because at home I'm speaking one way. Mm -hmm. And then at the age of three, I was falling in love with stories. Yeah. And so then I started reading books at an early age. And I, I developed this great command of the English language, right? And so at school, when I first got into, you know, school settings, 
I would speak how I was taught to speak at home and I was constantly getting corrected and constantly getting frustrated because I'm speaking correctly. I understand that frustration. I'm, I'm speaking the way that my family has taught me to speak. Right. But when it came time to me writing papers, they're like, hold up, you, you have a high vocabulary. Mm. You know subject verb agreement. You you know all of these things that we haven't even taught you yet. Yeah. Yeah. So I had to constantly code switch. Oh, I wonder in other countries, is there something like this that goes on in, in your languages? Like it's not slang. And I know that's what he's gonna get to. It's not yeah. slang. It's it's our language, and also me and Dion from Louisiana. We don't just speak African American vernacular English. We speak well. We're learning Cory Vinny, which is our Louisiana Creole. It's a dying language, and what we have to, we have taken it upon ourselves to teach ourselves and our children the language so that they know it and they can teach it on to their their children and their generation so that that can be something that we pass down just like our ancestors have passed down this language right, right, to us right, you right. know yeah and i want to go back to you tangent. uh talking about <laughs> the school how you would get you know corrected for how you speak but well, i'll get corrected for speaking the way i write or mm -hmm. writing the way i speak that's the way you put it i would write mm -hmm. the way i would speak so it wasn't punctuation mm -hmm. it wasn't grammar it wasn't spelling mm -hmm. it was just my wordplay and the teacher would read it and she said I don't talk like this, so this is wrong. Mm -hmm. And then she would mark all these remarks on my paper. She was like, we have to rewrite this sentence. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, for what reason do I have to rewrite it? And she said, well, because that's how it's being said. So when a reader is reading it, they want to have mm -hmm. a clear understanding on what you're trying to say. And I'm like, but mm -hmm. if you're asking me the same question, you would get it in my same speech development. Right, right. And then she would, you know, then backdoor me and say, well, you got to fix it this way because this is what, basically, from my understanding, the school would want you to put it as. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Correct. English and so yeah. when they would say the terms correct English, what is that? Right, right, right. They they speak in fake English at home. What's going on? You know, so and that goes to when some schools would tell students you can't talk like this mm -hmm. entering the classroom. Right, they would right, say right. it's they would call it slang and they would say you can't bring this into the school or you would get suspended, wrote, written up, and that's crazy because mm -hmm. this is how we talk at home mm -hmm. on the basketball court in the gym, yep. and then we come inside the school in the halls and they say it's wrong. Yep, yep, yep. Like, come on, like, that's yep, crazy. Yep, yep, yep. And if you have been on the channel for a long time, or not even a long time, just a couple videos in, y'all already know we're talking AAVE. Mm. We're going to say, we're going to use a B where it shouldn't be. Wait, that, that was funny. But y'all know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> our. Use a B where it shouldn't be. <laughs> yeah, like, our language, we, we, our words is just switched up, like, even gonna, or I shouldn't even be doing this. Over there. Over there. Mm -hmm. Like, I wouldn't put it's over so there much. on the paper, though. I would write it right over there. Right. It's you know like what I'm saying? being that we were taught a different language at home. And people may be like, what? No, you were taught English. No, like being that we were taught our dialects at home, going into school, we had to be wise enough to correct it to pass the test. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And your way you speak can also it's about getting in rooms too, right? So sometimes if you take yeah. how you speak at home into the front door of a business that you're finna get a job for, then they will want you to kind of like you mentioned, code switch it, mm -hmm. right? You got to take what you know, put it behind you, and take how they accept it and put it in front of you. Mm -hmm. That way you can get in the room. Right. That's crazy work. I didn't. Oh, wait. I'm gonna say this last comment. <laughs> I didn't feel appreciated with the skill. I don't want to call it the code switch because it's not that isn't code switch. That's well, I think that is that's code switch. Um, I didn't feel appreciated until I got to college and my voice and diction professor wanted to study the way I speak for the rest of the class to teach them about our language. All right, English. All right. yeah. <laughs> Black English is camouflage constructions. So let me give some examples. The most famous in linguistics is what is sometimes called habitual B. I actually don't really like the name and prefer the less used invariant B because it has more functions than marking habituality, but that is a main one. So if I say it be that way, that doesn't mean the same thing as it is that way. When you add the word sometimes, both end up meaning the same thing, but it be that way on its own has built in that it is that way sometimes and not necessarily right now. These can lead to miscommunications where people who don't speak black English 
think that they understand what's being said, but they're missing some of the nuance. And instead of recognizing that, they usually think that the black English speaker is just using bad grammar. So if I say, I'm going to call him at work, and my friend says, no, he don't be at work, I might understand the social communicative function of that speech act and choose not to call him, but I might miss the nuance. He isn't usually at work, so it's probably not a good bet, but my friend is not asserting that they know he isn't at work right now. In fact, it could be the case that he don't usually be at work, exactly. but in an unforeseen <laughs> turn of events, That's funny. he ain't right now. Did you notice? <laughs> <by the> way, <laughs> that you it's funny when you hear someone else explain it, bro. Right. It's like, yo, that's what we sound like. Yo, that is funny. It's like, and how he just said it, the, the way he tried to use our voice for it. Yo, that was hilarious. I feel understood. I did not know he was going to use B. Mm-hmm. That's, that's fine. That is fine. And I've mentioned it on the channel a couple times before, but I feel understood. Yeah, yeah. And I'm not saying just me. Everybody. No, nah, facts. It's I like, feel understood. It's like it's like taking somebody to the barbecue for their first time and they see somebody in the corner being loud playing spades and you be like, Oh, what's that? What are they doing all of that for? It'd be, like, oh, it'd be that it'd be that way sometimes. Mm -hmm. you know sometimes it get a little like that. Mm -hmm. you, it, if you go stand around, you'll learn a little something real quick. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? That's all. Yes, and it's the fact that he took the time to study it. That's hard, yeah. Because so often I see people cosplaying. And that isn't appreciating a culture that's appropriating a culture. That's what I was thinking about. That's that's the, that's the next alley. You know? Uh, so uh, he took the time to music. understand. You can get that in music. Exactly. No, he isn't at work right now. In fact, it could be the case that he don't usually be at work, but in an well, unforeseen turn of events, he ain't right now. He ain't right notice, now. <laughs> by the way that you can optionally delete the present indicative form of to be, just like in Hebrew, Russian, Arabic, Mandarin, and a ton of other languages. Habitual be isn't just about the habits, but can also be about generic states. Dr. Lisa Green calls the trickier abstract form bicycle sentences after an example from a famous interview where the speaker said something along the lines of some of them be big and some of them be small. This doesn't mean that each bicycle is usually big but sometimes small, like the magic school bus. An invariant B is just the tip of the iceberg. There's stressed been, which indicates remote perfect. I've you know how saying about to do that. I have been in English means it started in the past and it's relevant to the present, especially in like British English. Remote been usually indicates completion in the distant past and relevance to the present. So if I say, I've been told you that, it doesn't mean <laughs> I've been telling you that. It means I told you that a long time ago, dummy. Man. Linguist did an <laughs> informal study of white school teachers in Harlem in the 1970s and asked teachers, if your student says they been did their homework, is it completed or are they still working on it? And the majority of the teachers got it wrong. Using the dialect kids speak at teaching home to children, teach them literacy and then using the... Teaching children who you didn't take the time to teach yourself about. Mm, 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 mm. And that's why we say that we need... And yeah, it's, this is important to see, you know, black teachers in the schools, right? Because when those students get in a position to see them and their teachers, they grow and they want to be teachers as well, and then mm -hmm. they can go back and understand what the students are saying. It was LSU coach Kim Monkey. She had made a mention about her players that the interviewer was asking her, and it was it was really powerful. I, I really can't quote it right now because I don't want to misquote it because it was that good, but it was something about basically letting them be themselves or understanding them or mm -hmm. something along that line. So, yeah, I just want to make that mention real yeah. quick. Yeah. Yeah. Um, some people may think that it's motivated by, um, by money, but she is one of those coaches who really understands her players mm -hmm. and you could tell that she does just based off of the players interactions with her yeah, yeah. not based off of what she say but based off of them if i find a quote i definitely put it in the comment section for y'all i'll pin it with my name exactly i may put a pitch in now <laughs> homework is it completed or are they still working on it and the majority of the teachers got it wrong using the dialect kids speak at home to teach them literacy and then using the ability to read and write to teach them academic English was actually the proposal that kicked off the Oakland Ebonics controversy. Black English also has many more modal verbs than classroom English, although many of you might be familiar with them from social media or from them slowly being adopted into the mainstream. Mm -hmm. There's the future modal finna, originally from the very southern fixing oneself to do something. In the south, mm -hmm. everybody uses it. In the north, it was historically only speakers of black English, though that's changing. There's trina, which does not mean trying to. I'm gonna say that again. Trina does not mean trying to. It's a future modal that indicates intent, not attempt. 
That's how you can get a question like, when are you trying to leave? The same is the case for Bauda. And there's further reduction of gonna to gon and on and a. Uh. And all of these have different gradations of meaning when it comes to time. And not only does Black English have more grammatical distinctions in terms of time and aspect, but you can combine them. So you could have been gone there and you been could have gone there have different implications. Leave me a comment, by the way, if you think you can explain the difference. So what you have is a very robust grammatical system, but one that's built in part by using slightly different versions of the same words to do very different things. This has a few repercussions. First, because the words all sound like words other English speakers use, a lot of people completely fail to recognize they're being used to do something different. You'll almost certainly see this in the comments on this video. People who don't speak Black English will assume they know what is meant and not realize that they're shoehorning a different grammatical construction into one they already feel familiar with. And, and don't and please don't get it twisted, y'all. We can definitely hear the difference. We can yeah. read between them fitness and gunners <laughs> really good whenever somebody's trying to use it in the vocabulary. Mm -hmm. sense, I'm, I'm, it's crazy. Mm -hmm. And that process combined with stereotypes just kind of a race that black English exists. If you think I just talk lazy or have bad grammar, then you won't be attuned to the difference in meaning when I say, he don't be over there. You might think Ooh. a sentence like, he ain't working there today, but he be working there, is contradictory gibberish. You might not recognize that Oscar Gamble's famous quote, they don't think it be that way, but it do, is both grammatically correct for that dialect and perfectly clear. They don't think it's usually that way, but it is usually that way. And lastly, because the first two points people might get it wrong and not realize it. I mentioned this in my video on the word woke, and I've also mentioned this in interviews, but it's totally possible to get black English wrong, and plenty of people do. Sometimes it's Russian bots attempting to stoke racial tensions in the US on Twitter. Sometimes it's comedians using phrases they think sound funny. Sometimes it's corporate ad execs mashing up everything they think is teen speak. Babies on fleek. Okay, but my, my bae do though. Not and speakers fleek. of black English will immediately know that you're faking <laughs> it just like- fleek is slang. Mm. That that's slang. Yeah. Like most of you would notice about. immediately if I will start mix upping my tenses in regular the English. That's what you sound like to black Americans when you be saying, today's weather be like sunshine. Yeah, the thing about language and linguistic mm -hmm. ideologies, though, is that it's never really about the people. So if black English had less tense aspect and mood marking, people would say it's because those people are intellectually inferior and they can't do all the grammar that we sophisticates do. But when it has more... Even if I can convince you of that, it's easy for people to keep the disparagement, but flip the reason. Those people are intellectually inferior, and so their language doesn't have the elegant simplicity of ours. To quote a famous speaker of black English who you probably don't think of that way, you can't win. Send you can win, child. Of course. You can't take it. Of course. You can't win. You can't break even and you can't get out of the game. There's a lot more that I could say about this, so much more that it could fill a book, so if you're interested in that book, definitely drop a comment. I've already written chapters about the history of black English, regional dialects and homegrown flavor, how racism and the culture wars have shaped the academic study of it in weird ways, and an entire chapter on just all the memes. So if you want to hear about the time a middle-aged white guy blurted out, by Felicia, to a black linguist friend of mine, and what happened next, you're going to want to get a copy of this book. If you like what Yo. I'm doing with the channel, you can support me on Patreon at... Del yeah, yeah, yeah. Make sure you guys go check his channel out. We leave all videos in our description box, you guys. Right at the bottom of this. Um, But yeah, this was this was interesting. Yeah, yeah. Like what he did there. Yeah, going okay. into this, um, when it was requested, I thought it was like about uh, black British English. Mm. So I thought that was going to be interesting to see what's the differences between our um, black... I never called it Black English, I mean, African American vernacular English, yeah, and Black British um, English. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so yeah. if y'all have a video out there, let us know about it. This was Facts. a cool video. We hope you guys enjoy this video with us. Be sure to subscribe. We'll see you soon. Peace. Peace.